when you start to feel optimal, you just don't want to not feel optimal anymore. Like it sucks to feel like crap. That's one thing for sure. When I eat carbs, if I have French fries or ice cream, those are my two things, French fries and ice cream. There's three things that are going to happen. One, my sleep is going to suck. Number two, I get cramps. Um, and then the other one is I'm in the bathroom like five times a day for two days. Hey there, I wanted to let you know about my latest book, Body Confident, that's coming out in September 2024. Call it a critical thinking guide to your health journey because it is a framework, a guide, a blueprint that's going to help you understand and be able to filter all the information that's out there on the internet that you're getting from social media, YouTube, go to bodyconfidentbook.com, sign up for updates. The book comes out in September. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming to this episode of What I Don't Know because I haven't given this thing a name yet. Uh, we got we got uh, Casey Ruff on today. Casey's a good friend, a uh, fellow coach in the health and fitness space. We He's been doing this for a long time, has some great experience. And Casey, today, I just wanted to talk and just chat like coach to coach, uh, kind of just talk about experiences, what we're doing with clients, how we, you know, how we do things. Because I think there's a commonality that I want people, if you're listening to this, I want you to understand the commonalities of the things that we work with people, even though we do things differently. There's some things that we do very differently. We have different backgrounds, um, different approaches, but there's some things that even if I may implement something differently, I'm thinking some of the same things you were thinking about, about the why and the how and the things like that. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Casey. Um, where do you come from? What do you do? How did you get started? Tell us the whole story. We got two hours. No, I'm kidding. Just real quick. <laughs> where are you? What do you do? And um, how are you helping people now? Uh, man. Well, thank you. It's always such an honor to chat with you. I will always remember meeting you in person at Keto Salt Lake in 2022. It's been really fun to um, host you a few times on our show. And I'll never forget the question I asked you, whether like the fitness aspect of, of overall health mattered more than the nutrition aspect. And you said they are both the same. I That stands out to me as one of the moments um, that I really treasure in doing podcasting. So I really appreciate you and it's an honor to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Casey Ruff. Um, I have been a personal trainer for 17 years now. It was March of 2007 um, that I became certified as a personal trainer. I was studying architecture in college and joined a gym and was watching the personal trainers and thought it looked like really fun. And so I just kind of switched and got a certification for a job I thought I might have for a year or two and or whatever. And now it's become my career. Um, I worked for that gym for several years. I managed a metabolic testing program. And so we were measuring uh, basically like respiration. And, and understanding how people were burning their calories, um, how people could burn more fat and, and, you know, burn less carbohydrates as they were doing things and all the implications that came about. Uh, but the gym shut down, obviously, in 2020 um, as, as the COVID pandemic took hold and they invited us back to work. But it was, um, as you know, as a personal trainer, like it's a 100% commission job and we didn't have any clients. And so we just decided to open up our own business. My wife does the same thing and worked for the same company at the time. We weren't really great at we're running diversifying. Right? Why, why not, not make it for yourself at first, right? Exactly. Yeah. As you and Natalie know, like doing the same thing, like if something happened to the fitness industry, like it wouldn't, wouldn't be great <laughs> when you guys are doing the same thing. So I, we decided to open up our own business. So that was the birth of Boundless Body, um, which we opened in July of 2020. I started a podcast a few months later, which is Boundless Body Radio. And that's what we do. So um, yeah, I just help people with fitness, uh, primarily and also nutrition coaching. I got certified as a carnivore coach um in let's see that would have been april of 2020 the first like productive thing i did after the shutdown um that was about a year after being on carnivore myself i'd been into like low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets before then but um understanding how amazing carnivore diets were in my own life i did decided to get certified and i've been doing that since so yeah just help people with fitness and and nutrition coaching and um it's been a really fun journey yeah what's your personal um experience from in your journey from a health perspective did you have a lot of health things that you were dealing with that kind of got you into fitness or were you just kind of always active because i was kind of like for me i was always active as a kid i was you know i did weight training class in high school i joined the army that kind of stuff it wasn't until i got out of having that physical requirement in my life had kids started a desk job and then everything just went crap downhill put on 70 80 pounds had to be like and i had so i started fairly active and I thought I was in good shape. And that is what set me up kind of for the okie doke when I got older, right? I still had this image of, oh, I'm the skinny, athletic, you know, whatever. 
And then I really wasn't, had to realize, hey, something's cha- got to change. Did you have something similar or were you uh, unhealthy, overweight kid? Uh, what was your story there? I, I mean, don't don't you think that a lot of people in the fitness industry have that kind of a story where like we had to like recover our health to some extent? I didn't have, yeah. I wasn't diagnosed with anything. I, you know, I, I was definitely the chubby kid. I was very active. Um, I started lifting weights at age 15 after I got into a fight in middle school that I didn't want to get into and um, <laughs> had a nice, uh, nice black eye from that. <laughs> I, I yeah so so I you know you get you think you're following the right advice and I was into cycling I played ice hockey I've been in love with ice hockey since I was like a three year old um, so you do things but I just I knew growing up that like my mom had to buy like the husky clothes and I didn't even know what that meant but I knew it wasn't great um, and so yeah just kind of trying to sort out my own health um, I was a cyclist um, and and competed at it fairly decent level, at least like locally. And so like, I'm very used to the standard health advice. And what I was coaching people on is like for endurance sports in particular, you need lots of carbohydrates and you eat the oatmeal and the bananas and you stop at the gas stations to buy the, um, you know, the cookies and and things that you need to help keep you fueled up as you're riding a bike for several hours. And, you know, just over time, learning that there was another way of doing things and that people were getting really good results, especially in endurance sports, like feeding their athletes like fat, which was unheard of at the time. And they they were understanding that they could run their bodies on fat as a primary fuel source versus burning carbohydrates. Everything that I had been taught as an athlete that you needed carbohydrates to be able to do any kind of athletic sports, especially in endurance. And just understanding that over over time really changed um, my life and, and, you know, things like my body composition improved and, you know, I, I started to feel better and could do longer rides and, and felt better doing that and didn't need to eat as frequently as I started to switch over from eating lots of carbohydrates, to eating more, you know, proteins and fats. But it really was a switch in 2019 to like, I'm going to try a carnivore diet. I'm just going to do this for 30 days and see how this works. Um, see if I'll never like poop again or see if I will die of a heart attack in, in a few days that 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 was the game changer as far as like you know a week or two into a carnivore diet where the anxiety that i didn't think i had um just dropped out and i got to experience what it was like to just feel this like kind of like inner peace um that was really life-changing for me and i have not been willing to give up a carnivore diet since then it's come on five years and i'm just as happy now being 40 years old and feel better than i did as a 30 year old and my anxiety is just gone and I, I just have loved every second of it so yeah, yeah um that was i guess kind of my own personal health story again it definitely wasn't anything severe like people that you and i interview um like serena music is a great example you just hosted her on your show and like she had perosmia and all these crazy issues and she went to a carnivore diet because there was like nothing else for her to eat yeah um it, it, it yeah it, it wasn't as severe as that but definitely noticing that my my life it's just so much better when I when I focus on a carnivore diet that just was really life changing for myself. But- How do you stay consistent with your lifestyle? Oh man, that's a really great question. How do I stay consistent? I I stay consistent because being inconsistent um, really affects me now. Like it's it's almost the reason why when somebody starts on a carnivore diet. I- if they can string together a few days or a few weeks of just eating carnivore, I almost encourage them to like try a cheat and see how they feel mm-hmm. because it really punishes them. Like one of my favorite memes um, <laughs> that was going around a few years ago, yeah, making fun of carnivores. <laughs> What's that? I said, yes, we want to punish our clients. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> one of my favorite memes, making fun of carnivores and people on the carnivore diet. It's so true. First of all, it's great. But like in the first screen, it shows like, bro, carnivore diet. And then the second picture is like, oh, I ate a piece of bread. My back hurts, <laughs> which it, it's it's funny. But it's also like very true. Like if you start eating the right foods, when you drift off of that, uh, you really don't feel good. And you start to pay the price. And like, you know, the Thanksgiving where I have you potatoes and my tooth hurts for a day and a half. Or the last time I had a pie a few years ago, I wanted to have a few bites of a pie. I ate the whole thing. And my anxiety for like 36 hours was terrible. Yeah. It was it was off the it's... charts. And I slept like, and it's like, you know, is it is it that like we're we're you know, kind of made it plastic like now and we can't endure like having little bites of things like maybe, but also like when you start to feel optimal, 
you just don't want to not feel optimal yeah. anymore. Like yeah. it sucks to well, feel like crap. Yeah, there's, you know, like for me, you said the sleep. That's one thing for sure. When I eat carbs, if I have French fries or ice cream, those are my two things: French fries and ice cream. That I'll every once in a while I'll indulge in. But it, I know if I'm going to do that, there's three things that are going to happen. Three things are going to happen. One, my sleep is going to suck for at least two days. Number two, I get cramps. When I eat uh, ice cream or have French fries, my toes, dude, I like they're like ah, like. They literally, even <laughs> I can preload electrolytes all day. I can overhydrate. I can do whatever. The minute I have those, my toes just lock out. The other, you know, it. I actually had some ice cream uh, or French fries a couple weeks ago. Um, I was walking around for half an hour because I couldn't. I had to keep my feet moving, otherwise they would just lock up. My toes just lock up. <laughs> it was. A, I'm like, I, I. Wow. This is why I don't do this. This is ridiculous. Um, and then the other one is I'm in the bathroom like five times a day for two days. Yeah. Um, but what you're talking about is often I, people tell me all the time, like, well, it's not good to have a reaction to foods that you should be able to eat. It's like, okay, well, wait a second. Let's, let's dig into that for a second. Who says I should be able to eat ice cream? Who says I should be able to eat French fries? Where is this assumption that all of these things are something that should be part of, Right. If I'm taking these things out and the idea that uh, we use in the health space, right? The said, the said principle, I always, is it sad principle, said principle, said principle? I, I was, I never know how to pronounce the acronym, right? <laughs> Specific adaptation to impose demands. Our body will adapt to the stresses and stimulus that we give it to adapt to. So if those stimulus, whatever it is, are consistent and repetitive enough, our body will change to adapt. So if I am consistently giving myself ice cream and French fries, it will adapt to manage and process that stress because that's what it is. It's a stress. All food, all food when it hits your body is a stressor. And when I take that out, my body adapts to not having it. So it's, it's, it's just an adaptation thing. It's not a good or bad thing, right? Unless we apply that value to it. So I apply a value of negative, um, impact on my life to having my feet cramp up to the point where I can't sit still and have to walk around for half an hour. That's not something I want to deal with every time I eat something, right? I, I, I attribute a negative value to the quality of life that I'm living to having to go to the bathroom five times a day because I ate something that I don't normally eat, right? And remembering also when I used to eat that stuff all the time, I used to be in the bathroom all the time. So it's not just a one-time thing. This is, if I decide to do this on a regular basis and because I should be able to eat it, then my life now revolves around the bathroom, which is one of the reasons why I stopped eating it in the first place. Yep. Bronson, that is so well explained. I really appreciate that, that explanation. And I think it's something that I question all the time. Like, are we becoming too fragile because we're not eating certain foods? I, I don't think that's the case. And again, your explanation, I think, is is perfect. We adapt to those types of things. Like uh, the gym that I go to and train at, um, <laughs> people people that like now know me and understand me know that like at 8 a.m. when I'm training my client, we're always talking about like the steak we had the night before. And so they, they called it like steak talk. Yeah, it's steak right. talk at 8 in the morning. <laughs> Uh, and, and just a comment I got the other day is like, oh, wow, you ate a ribeye, an entire ribeye and 10 eggs last night. Like, did you spend your entire day in the bathroom? And I just, I thought it was funny because like, I used to keep books and magazines in my bathroom and like, uh, there was a reason for that. I would like hang out in the bathroom for a while. And so I could like read something. And now like, not only do I not go very many times, but like the time I spend in there is like three seconds. I, I don't like have time to read while I'm in there. <laughs> You, with all the digestive issues you suffer through, can definitely understand oh, that. Sure, for sure. I used to go in. It was it was weird. That was actually one of the things that um, was a realization to me at one point through the process when I first got when I first changed my nutrition um, lifestyle. Was this is really annoying? I don't have enough time to finish what I'm reading. <laughs> That's funny. It was like, wait a second. <laughs> I don't even need to bring this stuff in here with me anymore. Like. It, it was that was part of the realization. It was kind of crazy. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, that's a really funny. <laughs> it's 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 amazing how those little things can affect can affect your life. Um, yeah, it really is. 
um, it really is. And like, as you know, like now doing carnivore for so long and talking to so many carnivores, you start to expect certain things. Like there's expected results on these things. And like when, when somebody lists like 20 or 30 things that improved when they went to carnivore, like not only their digestion, but their skin is better and they never get sunburns and like their recovery from injury is so much better. Like there's so many different things that people name that are now like expected results that when somebody tells me like, yeah, I, I never get athlete's foot anymore or like I never get the sunburns. Like you, you start to expect that and you realize like how big of an impact nutrition really has. Yeah. And yeah, you just, you just don't miss that feeling of feeling optimal. And it's, it starts to like really kind of incentivize you as far as your like consistency question how do you say consistent like well i it's easy to stay consistent when you know i i don't suffer from those things day to day it's easy to you know say i i will eat ice cream or french fries a little bit less you know what i mean yeah yeah what is it because here's the here's the argument that i see i saw a um i i hate promoting the people that i feel are not really authentic in their in their message or consistent in their message because they go with where the algorithm tells them to go um, out there in the space. But um, I, or they've taken a stance that is controversial just because it's controversial, regardless of the science, the evidence that's out there. But that being said, in case anyone wants to know where I stand on Lane Norton, uh, I saw uh, a, a video that he posted, that he posted with, I forget who he was interviewing with or whatever where he, they, they quote him in the clip of saying, and he basically, I don't remember exactly the, the quote, but it was something along the lines of, uh, if anybody tells you that one thing is the cure-all or the fix-all for everything, then you shouldn't be listening to them. So mm. what we're talking about, and I think what a lot of people are, it, let's say nobody's ever listened to us talk before, and they're hearing this conversation, they're hearing us say that carnivore fixes everything. And that's a common conception. That's a common talking point for a lot of people who are opposed to the carnivore, low carb, keto lifestyle. You can't say that this one thing fixes everything. So let's just say, let's take the name out of it. What is it? Because I've seen it in my life. You've seen it in your life. We both work with hundreds of people over the past five or six years. And we've seen the impact that this lifestyle from a nutrition perspective, we haven't even talked about the fitness piece and how the two tie together, right? Cause there's a whole nother fitness piece that when you tie all of this stuff together, it is transformative in a way that I think people don't even comprehend, but what is it? Let's just talk about the nutrition piece. You just said nutrition is super important. What are the things about nutrition that impact so much and so many different areas of someone's life that have nothing to do with carnivore as the label? If that makes sense. That, that's such a great question. I mean, I'll just I'll just come right out and say like people who attack other people viciously online to get clicks. I don't I don't care. Carnivore vegan. I I don't care. Yeah. Like just based on character, not a fan. I just I think that's frankly I would never do that. I know you would never do that. I have hosted people on my show who are plant based and have reversed. <laughs> all kinds of different things like cancer and bipolar yeah, on plant-based or vegetarian diets. And, and I, I don't agree with it, but they do it and they've done it. And that's awesome. And I, I just, I would never spend one second of my life going out and attacking other people for what they think or what they believe. And I see that with, uh, people such as the person you mentioned <laughs> and I, I, I frankly just don't respect it. There are people that I will like, I, I could understand that if I hosted this person and got some like attention around it, I maybe would grow my viewership and maybe more people would subscribe. And I don't, I don't, I don't care. I will never invite those people and they yep. will not be on my show. Yep. The, the person, uh, Lay Norton that you mentioned was at low carb Denver, 2023. I got to see the person. I went out of my way not to meet him in person. I just not really my thing, but I did sit in the audience and listen to him. I, there was a subset of people that wanted to boycott him and didn't want to listen to his message and they all left and that's fine. I wanted to stay and listen to what he had to say. Sure. And I, I just, I realized in that day when he was making his presentation, what he talks about and his kind of message is around basically like weight control and how you can control weight by focusing just on calories. Yep. And it doesn't matter what you eat, as long as the calories are controlled, you can control your weight. And that's fun and that's cute and you know, whatever. And I realized after listening to him 
talk about his message and controlling weight with calories. And then listening to Dr. Chris Palmer, who's talking about things like Alzheimer's and dementia and brain fog and like serious mental disorders that can be improved on a carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. And then I listen to Dr. Tro Kalajian, who's talking about like informed consent. Like we should be informing our patients that if they don't know about a ketogenic diet, they're going, they're, they're going to have like serious health issues and it's our responsibility to inform them. W when you hear the contrast between the two, like frankly, like it sounds like one is playing in the sandbox while the other is teaching like classes at the highest level to other doctors. There, there's just such a contrast yep. to like, yeah, you can use calories to control your weight, but I'm talking about like not having bipolar or like doing non like kind of traditional methods of curing yep. cancer. Like it's such a different ball game. And again, like when I switched to a carnivore diet, me personally, like having my anxiety drop out and be gone and to have like clear thinking and to have stressful situations happen where I can just like think of other solutions very easily like it's it's just such a different ball game yeah. that people are playing you know what i mean yeah it's, so, it's, it's the right we have the um commodities versus the high ticket items right it's it's weight loss is the commodity everybody's talking about it it's what everybody thinks they need it's what society is telling people that's what they should be looking for and because if you focus on weight loss it opens you up to a whole bunch of products a whole bunch of services a whole bunch of special uh, you know coaching it's and this is actually really interesting, the corollary here. I just made a, visit, a video that will be coming out in a couple of weeks, um, just like a 10-minute video of me talking about longevity and how the, the topic of longevity is a manufactured problem, right? It's the same thing with weight loss. It's a manufactured problem. Weight loss is a problem because we've been given the information, the um, mental, the perception, the products, and the support system to make weight loss a problem. Everything about our environment and society is is built on weight being the problem, even though weight isn't the problem. It's all the other things that are the problem that are causing weight to be the problem, right? It's such a it's a, such a defeating circle of of different factors, but um, it's what sells, and that's the thing. It's what sells for a small subset of people. Dr. Palmer talking about. This is, there's, there's this thing you can do just with your diet and lifestyle that can, that can reduce your risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. This is a much smaller subset of people who want to know about weight loss. So the, the message, um, is very different because it's, it creates a different dollar value, essentially. <laughs> that's, that's so well explained. I, yeah, you and I are in this industry and like trying to help people with weight loss and health and fitness and all these different things. And you just, you really recognize very quickly, like the people that are trying to sell snake oil. And that's what makes your original question so difficult to answer. Like we're trying to tell people that this way of eating is going to transform so many different things. And yeah, we can't say that a carnivore diet is going to fix everything, but it, it sure seems like it fixes a, a lot, lot of things. Yeah. yeah, just like the way Serena answered your question about it on your show. Like, I wish people would try it. I wish people would give it a good college try for 30 days mm -hmm. and just see. Like, so many people, like she explained, are willing to stretch out a 30-day trial to 60 days or 90 days or do what you and I did, where we start it and we don't want to stop ever because it feels so good. And it does fix a lot of things. Yes. So... We can't go around saying that it fixes everything, but boy, it, it makes a big difference. And I wish more people would try, if somebody, you know, if somebody were to ask you, why does carnivore work for so many things? If you're telling me that I can do carnivore and all these things are going to change. Why? How? What's that all about? What are, what are like <sighs> Another... top three things, three or four things that you would say, these are the, the big picture, the, the low hanging fruit or the, the, the most impactful pieces of why the carnivore diet works. Great question. I love that question. I would say, first of all, that a carnivore diet gives you everything that you need and nothing that you don't. Yeah. Can, can you eat plants? Yes. Can you prepare plants in a way that they are less harmful for you? Absolutely. Is there going to be a question 
when you eat plants of whether that's going to affect you or not, yes, there's always going to be a little bit of doubt. And so like a really good example is yesterday, a client of mine texted me um, a, a, a paragraph from Sally Norton's book, um, Toxic Superfoods, and it was all about chocolate. And she's been super stressed and she's talking about how she's been eating more chocolate lately and it can impact these certain things. And it said in the book, like this much chocolate has this much oxalate and this can get in your body and, and like not have a really good reaction. And I'm sitting there thinking about like how this person is identifying that chocolate may not be great for her. She said she's felt like lately with all this like stress she's had, yep. she's not eating her, her exact way uh, of eating. And she's like wondering out loud, like, is this much, much oxalate really affecting me? And frankly, I don't know. I really don't know. And that's the point is I don't know when you eat plant foods, there's going to be side effects that I don't know how much they're going to affect you or not. Are they going to have a big impact? Maybe. Are they not? Maybe that's much true too. Maybe people can tolerate that better than other people. So first of all, I just think it removes all questions. When you eat meat, you are, first of all, you're eating the most nutrient dense food that you can possibly eat that gives you everything you need, but also it gives you nothing that you don't. I really appreciate the way the author Jane Reese Buxton talks about this and her amazing book called The, the Great Plant-Based Con. She's got two separate questions that say like one, what, or I'm sorry, two separate chapters where one chapter is like, these are all the things that you are not going to get if you're eating a plant-based diet. Here's all the nutrients you're going to be missing. So you need to supplement things like DHA, EPA, uh, B12. I mean, you name it. There's so many different things you're going to be deficient in, but also here's all the things you're going to get in excess when you're eating a plant-based diet or you're including plants in the right. diet. You're going to have oxalates and lectins and phytates and all these different plant chemicals like salicylates. Like the list goes on and on. And whether those things impact people in a big way or not, you, there's always going to be a question. So I think that's probably my number one thing is like this is going to be the diet that gives you everything you need and nothing you mm -hmm. don't. And then I just think like, like to hear all the stories that you and I hear of healing from crazy, severe issues that, that that people are like sorting out on a carnivore diet when they push to get more fat and protein in their diet that comes from animal products and they start healing and feeling much better from man I, you hear like alzheimer's in remission uh, bipolar in remission cancer that just magically goes away like all these incredible things it's just i don't know i guess i guess that would be my top like two or three things is like this is the diet that gives you everything you need it gives you nothing that you don't and it seems to fix all these amazing things in a way that yeah like w you and i can agree this we can't say that a carnivore diet fixes everything but it sure seems yeah. to help out with a lot yeah. of different things yeah. what is the um how do you get people started with making changes in their lifestyle I, I would love to hear your answer to this question as well. Yeah. It, it, it's it's a challenge for sure. I don't know as much as I want to like scream this message from the rooftops and get all my clients to do what I do and try this. Oh, it's, it, it's kind of funny when you re when you really look at like clients, like not that many people actually do it, even though they know very much like what I do. You, donuts taste really good. <laughs> <laughs> Ice cream and French fries taste. What's really good and people have exactly what's, what's that go to oh man i am so glad that i am past the point that any donut sounds good really? to me anymore. Uh, i still uh, i still have uh boston creams on the brain man <laughs> that's, that's funny. the only like uh, the pastry wise if the, i i could pass up pretty much anything but if you put a boston cream in front of me i'm always like <laughs> can't pass I don't it up know. that's funny that's funny yeah, I, you know, my punishment of, of eating that would be so severe that it doesn't appeal to me anymore. Yep. In the past, I probably would have said maple bars, to be wow, fair. Okay. Yeah. And, and I'm talking like the cheap, crappy maple bars from like the, the, the cheap grocery store down the street. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like ice cream sandwiches. Like oh, I, I don't ice, care for ice cream off. sandwiches anymore. But the cheapest, grossest ice cream sandwiches yep. are the best. Yep. Like five to a pack, <laughs> you best. buy the five pack or whatever and just... What it's yeah. yeah. Oh, I would all yep. of them like down yep. the hatch, like no problem. Yep. Yeah. I'm lucky I'm past that point, but yeah, getting somebody like started in this way, it, it's challenging because food tastes really good. And so again, I would love to hear your answer to this question. If I have a way in with somebody and they're open to changing things, I really just start with like, let's just at least increase the amount of animal fats and proteins, like have a steak, have ground beef, what whatever animal food sounds really good that has a decent amount of fat and protein and really attack that uh -huh. food until you have an aversion to that same food like the other day i cooked a big old ribeye it was delicious 
and I got to the point where there were like literally like three bites left. I'm down to my, my last few bites. I couldn't finish it. I, it sucks to like have to get out like a container, to like save it for the next day. But like, I literally couldn't put it in my mouth yeah. anymore because I'd eaten to like full satiety and those, those hormones that tell you that you're full, man, they're so strong. And so that would be my way in with people. And as much as I want to, again, like scream it from the rooftops and I want to be, you know, willing to say like all my clients are doing carnivore and they're thriving and it's amazing. Like that's just not the reality, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so if I can get somebody to eat more animal fat and protein, I think that's great. Other than that, I think the only thing that, that we can do in this community is be an example, like just like to be, you know, over 50 as you are in reverse aging to have turned 40 a few months ago and feel like I can still, you know, skate at the highest level with my buddies on, on the ice when I play hockey or just tell my clients that I never get sick or get my, I just recently did a calcium artery score that came back as a zero after five years of eating nothing but cholesterol and saturated fat. I think the only thing that we can do is just be that. I know, I know it's a mind blower. Even I was like nervous getting it done. Like <laughs> I, I, I think it's going to be good, but I wonder. And, and yeah, I, I think that's the best thing that we can do is just try to be an example when people are ready, hopefully they can come around and when they're ready to, if they can at the very least just focus on animal fats and no. proteins in their diet, I think that will help weed out other things that, that people realize are not yeah, great for them. Yeah. I think for me, it's uh, making the assumption that we've already covered the, the motivation, the why, understanding what it is they're doing and why they want to do it. Um, and they're ready to actually start making some changes. Uh, I think it's different for everybody. I like to take a, a holistic approach because I'm not looking at weight loss. I'm not looking at just getting stronger. I'm not looking at any one aspect of a person's life. When people work with me in any of my programs, the idea is we're trying to improve the whole of your life, the whole of your experience. Mm. So the first change that you may need to make, the first thing we may need to work on is I'm not going to touch what you eat. I'm not going to touch your fitness. I'm not going to touch anything. You need more sleep. That could be the first thing mm. that this, that a person does work. The first, the first thing could be, um, we're not going to change anything. All I want you to do is write down what you eat every day. And then we'll talk about it after mm. two weeks. Right. So what every, what each person needs for me, I think really starts with um, just all the questions. Give me everything you possibly can about your life. And then it's the minimum effect. I heard mm -hmm. that term a couple of years ago, and it's, it's the perfect way to describe how you make progress. You just make, what is the minimum thing that we can do to move you forward? Let's figure that out. It's going to cause the least disruption to you and your family. That's a big one. I work with mostly women mm. in their forties who have kids that are, you know, teenagers or young adults who they're living with supporting or whatever it may be, um, who have, you know, families and they're often the ones running the show. So if they change their schedule, the entire household, if they change anything in their lifestyle, the entire household is affected by it. So we have to find things that are attainable, sustainable, and it causes minimal ripples in the rest of their lives. So I think that's the, it's really just about what is the one thing that can make the biggest bang for the buck with the smallest amount of disruption to everything else? Because if it disrupts everything, it's not sustainable. That's mm -hmm. kind of how I look at it. I love that. I love the term minimal effective dosage as well. And if I look at any of the habits that I have in my life where I've changed something for the better or gotten rid of a bad habit, the, th the ones, the habits that stuck were the habits that I changed so slowly and so gradually that I was able to maintain them. When I tried to do something really drastic, mm -hmm. I was not able to maintain that. And I think we can see that with our clients as well. One example that I'll give on that is like a few years ago, not a few years ago, it's over a decade ago when Fitbit started to become like really oh, popular. Yeah. We were selling them at the gym that I was at in like 2011, 2012. So we started to do step challenges and to see who could get the most steps in a day. And I started parking at the very furthest spot in the parking lot that I could find to get some extra steps to walk into the store. And guess what? Like that was again, over a decade yep. ago, I've never stopped that. Habit. Awesome. It's faster for me. Like I, I don't have to fight for parking spots uh, and, and think about like not only the extra steps, but the extra sunlight and the extra fresh air and the extra, all this other stuff that I've gotten with it, you know, doing farmer carries with my, you know, tri tips or whatever <laughs> I bought at the store. There's a man walking around <laughs> or, the parking lot with meat in his hands. 
<laughs> exactly. You know, I'm the only person at Costco that's like running on my cart and like riding it like a bobsled through the parking lot with a cart full of like eggs and butter and brisket. I'm so glad um, I'm not the only person to do that. Glad you're the only other person I've heard of doing that. That's great. Those, those little habits stick. And I just, I think like how much has that accumulated and helped me out throughout my entire life when you start to compound that over time. And so minimal effective dosage is a great way to think about habit change and how to make things consistent and how to stick. Like just start with something very, very small that you think is almost like laughable to get yes. started with. It's so easy and simple. And guess what? That's going to compound over a number of days and weeks and months yeah. and years. So yeah. I love that yeah. approach. What is, let's switch from, we've been talking a lot about carnivore nutrition and lifestyle, things like that. What about fitness? What is your, what is your go-to, like when you work with people from a fitness perspective as a personal trainer, um, this is actually a topic that I have been mulling over for like a year that I'm trying to figure out how I want to present this. And that is, you tell me what you think about this. Uh, we'll get, then we'll get into what you do. Um, you're familiar with NASM and their OPT yeah. model, right? The uh, optimal yeah. uh, optimum performance training model, right? I was exposed to that after spending seven, eight years at a CrossFit as a CrossFit coach, many levels ah. of CrossFit certifications, owning a gym, coaching for years, hundreds of people through CrossFit, and understanding the difference, after. The, the core difference between the two models is with with CrossFit, the concept, the base level concept is the magic is in the movement, right? I can get you better in every aspect of fitness by having you do every aspect of fitness scaled to your current ability, right? If you look at the OPT model, and this is something that I'm, I'm debating on doing a versus or a, the, the missing aspect, like I, there's, I think there's benefit in the, in the OPT model, but I think there's some things missing based on my experience. Um, in the OPT model, it starts with stabilization, then strength, then power. Like you build up in phases. And I see this all the time. And this is why I wanted to do this video, because I see personal trainers who are trained in this type of type of um, method, I guess, uh, where it's, you know, you got someone who hasn't done any fitness and they're over here doing one legged step ups on boxes and BOSU ball work and all these different things to try to build their, their stabilization. And I'm looking at them going, I'm like, just get them to squat well, they will get all the stabilization they need if they just learn how to squat with their body weight. Work on that and all of the other pieces that their body requires will come into play to then they can squat properly and move on to the next step, right? And so just thinking about all the different um, ways there are to train, you know, and not saying that any one's better than the other, because again, you know me, I'm much more about principles. If you're a beginner, and you're going to come in and do OPT, you're going to see more progress than if you're not doing anything. So I would rather have you train with a personal trainer who trains OPT than not do anything at all. Um, and the same with, you know, I have clients and maybe this is something I have clients come to me saying, well, how good is, is Zumba going to help me? Like it's going to help you more than sitting on a couch will. Right. So when you have people that come and talk to you about, you know, how do I get started or what I'm, what am I doing as a client for my, you know, for, for you as a personal trainer, what are the things that you look at? How do you get people started on the fitness side of things now? This is probably the best question I've ever been asked on <laughs> any <laughs> interview. I'm serious. This is a fascinating question to me. And what an interesting um, kind of contrast where you had already been doing like CrossFit for so many years before you heard of NASM yep. and CPT, where that was my primary introduction. When I walked into my manager's office at the club I was, you know, belonging to and working out at to be a personal trainer, the very first thing the dude told me is you need to get your NASM certification. Yep. So OPT is exactly the first thing that I had gotten. Now I haven't read my textbook in 17 years. I took everything I needed what? to, to pass the test. And I know I can, you believe it <laughs> slacker, terrible slacker. Um, <laughs> but, but yes, you learn this model of personal training. And it was so awesome. The day that I passed my certification from NASM, I knew everything that I needed to know about personal training. That, that was the day that I knew the very most about personal training. I knew exactly how somebody needed to do those yep. step ups, how somebody needed to squat, how somebody needed to deadlift. You could make a bazillion corrections. You understood like a little bit about anatomy. And if somebody's foot was turned out by three degrees, like, oh, you need to start to correct this. And so you do this hour long session with somebody and you spend 
spend a certain amount of time foam rolling and doing stretching and this is what you need to strengthen and here's all these things you need to do and it was very complex and complicated and I think as a personal trainer it feels good to feel like that's your value as a trainer is like you know every little thing about every little exercise and this is exactly the amount of sets and reps and there's a different amount of reps like you mentioned if you want to have power you do this many sets with this many yep. reps and that gives you power where you do a different amount of sets and reps if you want to build stabilization and so it was all very complex and like i said as a personal trainer that's where you feel like your value is because you understand that and you have this endless amount of things and variables that you can control to be able to give your clients this feeling of like oh this is the very best perfect program for you we're going to do all this corrective work and and blah 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 and i i, I agree with you a hundred percent when you say that like this is better than nothing like is zumba better than sitting on the couch yep. absolutely is zumba the very best thing that's probably going to get to your goals that's debatable it depends on what your goals are so i would say that like in my career the thing that changed me and my approach to things the most was was discovering the work of dr doug and guff in his book body by science he was not the first person to come up with the kinds of things that he talks about in his book that he wrote also with john little but but he made it so concise and and so um i guess understandable for me that that really changed my career and the way i approach things so i mentioned that i i play ice hockey I love to play ice hockey. And if I were training an ice hockey player in the past, I would say, great, let's go to the gym. Let's do things that look like ice hockey in, in the gym. Let's maybe jump back and forth like you're striding in hockey. And maybe let's like swing this, um, you know, band that looks like a hockey stick that's, uh, you know, has some resistance on one end, whether you're trying to dick, do like a slap shot or whether you're trying to slash somebody in the neck, like that will help you with those things. <laughs> And like, like we would we would do those things and like you mentioned like step ups and box jumps and all these different ex exercises and activities like yeah that's better than nothing but i just don't really see as much value in those things as i did in the past and you mentioned things like squatting like yes like that's kind of like where you can get that minimum effective dosage and the best bang for the buck let's get a good squat in if you can't squat let's leg press let's do some chest presses and let's do some seated rows and pull downs and shoulder presses and like these main core movements that strengthen you and get you really strong and let's find a way to train that will not get you injured that will keep you moving and keep you strong and yes i agree a hundred percent that like if you can do those things and be strong <clears throat> that gives you the stabilization that gives you the core strength it gives you all these other things and like i look at my training and in fact like the client that i train after this i've already done like program design for there are things on here that look like the opt model we start with some core stabilization i've got this person doing planks and some bridges and some twists i don't know that that's the best thing it just helps give me some like structure in the way that i design my workouts to this day but no i don't think that that's the very best thing to do with everybody all the time i think the best thing you can do for fitness is make yourself very strong in a way that is really really mm -hmm. safe the way that we look at machines for example like i used to think that machines were stupid and you had to do things with like trx bands and resistance bands and i find value in all of those things but i also think that machines are an awesome way to make yourself very strong and if you can be very strong your metabolic rate's going to improve your um stabilization is going to improve like everything's going to improve globally from doing that and so that's the way i've, I've kind of changed my thinking around that what about you how would you well, answer that question I, again i think that was one of the best questions i've yeah, ever been I asked think, uh, i'm looking up a quote right now actually this is one of the things so greg glassman the founder of crossfit um he's got so many good quotes and different things that he said over the years um the first one was when the magic is in the movement and i was basically saying like if you want to get better at movement then move sure. and that's it that's that's it's as simple as that um then he also said this one thing that has been a real driving factor in my philosophy when it comes to fitness. He said, the needs of the elderly and professional athletes differ by degree, not kind. Where one needs functional Man. competency to maintain independence, the other needs functional mastery to maintain dominance. So we all have, Weird. we're human beings. We all have the same physical requirements to move our bodies. Me as a 51 year old who just wants to be functional as I get older, I don't need to spend all that time learning specific movements on how to do a slap shot, right? I just need to learn how to be able to get up and down off the toilet when I go take a crap when I'm 80 years old, right? 
I need to know how to pull this bag or pull this thing out of my cupboard. I need to do these things. These are basic movements that everybody needs. On the flip side of that, this is one of the things that really, when I own my gym, used to drive me crazy. And, you know, whenever I'm in gyms and I see personal trainers, particularly dealing with youth athletes, I see so many trainers and so many athletes and coaches and programs who spend so much, too much harmful time, wasted time in sports specific training for 15 year olds who can't squat properly to try to get them to be better football players, better soccer players, better basketball players, better baseball players before they become good athletes, right? You have to be able to control your body under stress first before you learn how to accurately control movement under stress. Mm. You got to get the general stuff done. And it goes the same for human, for, for us as adults. I, I, what I'm hearing is the same progression, I think. I love talking to coaches who have many years of experience because we all go through the same process. We start with, this is the thing. And then we start realizing, well, that's, that thing is there, but it's, there's also this thing. Oh wait, then there's also this thing. And then there's also this thing. And wait, maybe I can put all these things together and tailor a program to my clients because everybody's different. Mm -hmm. um, but we go through this thing where as adults, we tend to focus on, this is the thing that I'm going to do without realizing, well, is that thing what I need right now? And often we need to step back and try to figure out what is the foundational, what is that basic thing that I need to get done before I start doing this, right? Do I need to be doing cold check to cold baths, cold plunges, if I'm still eating ice cream every, every night? What's the benefit? What's the waste of time? Like, what am I doing at that point? So a lot, a lot of the things I think that when it comes to fitness, um, just asking yourself, what am I trying to get out of doing this? And is this the thing for me? or that goal. So yeah, I, you know, I, I agree with you from a base level strength is number one. I think m the ability to move your body is, is the two of those in combination. Um, probably set the foundation it. for everything else. I love it. That's so well said. I, yeah, I absolutely love it. If you look through all my programs with my people, like there's the couple I train there in their sixties. There's the woman I train virtually she's in her seventies. There's the 15 year old who's doing motocross. There is, uh, I, the, the 40 year old who's overweight and wants to lose weight. Like those, those yep. are different programs. Yep. Like there are differences and I don't train those people the same. That said, I train all of those people in an extremely similar way. We might yes. do different things. There might be differences, but at the end of the day, it's kind of going to be about the same. I don't train a 90 year old very different than I train a 14 year old. I, I just yep. don't like, there are core movements and principles that will follow and we can work with what you enjoy, what you have available, what you um, can do, what, what looks like kind of the things that you do in real life. Like we can incorporate all those things and make them different. And I want them to be engaged. I want people to enjoy what they do and enjoy their programming. And some people, I can do the exact mm -hmm. same workout seven days in a row and they love it and they'll just do the same workout. And other people, if I do the same workout twice, they will fire me. <laughs> so we work that within crazy. those parameters. It is, it's totally crazy. And, and whatever, wherever you are on that spectrum, as a coach, you and I will work with those people and we'll make this for you. That said, we're going to stick with the same principles and I would stick to the exact same principles that you outlined we want to move. We want to be strong. That, that, that is not like vastly different between yep. multiple yep. people. Absolutely. Absolutely. What is the challenge? How do you, t okay, this is a, this is a similar, we'll talk, we're still talking about fitness. Um, but this is something that I come across, uh, two aspects of this one, the phrase that you may have heard or whether it's been said, just evidenced in what someone's doing, the idea that you have to get in shape to get a trainer. Um, or get in shape to start working out, to go to the gym. Like I'm not in shape enough to go to the gym. Um, or just the fear in general of going to a gym. Yeah, great question. That reminds me of the Jim Gaffigan bit that he did where he said he goes to the gym and like sees fit people at the gym. And he's like, why are fit people at the gym? You guys are done. You can go home. Like, what <laughs> right. do you do here? <laughs> you don't need to see this place. Yeah, I, I wish more people would hire a trainer. I wish more people yeah. would hire a trainer. I, I, it's just, if people understood 
how we are going to be able to teach you a skill that you're going to use for the rest of your life. Um, I wish more people would appreciate the value in that and would be willing to invest in learning how to do that so they can do that for the rest of their life, whether they work with a trainer for a few weeks, a few sessions, or for the rest of their life. You know what, um, you know I, what I you put me, as you, I just, do sorry, I don't interrupt, interrupt, but you just hit me. This goes Please. back to what we were talking about before. Um, you don't need a trainer to lose weight. Most people, mm, most people look right. at trainers as them paying someone to keep them on track so they can lose weight without mm. quitting. That is yeah. not what a coach or trainer or person trainers all. It's not what it's about. And that that goes yeah. into that that distorted view of what we're actually trying to do. It's hard yeah. for us to sell ourselves as trainers to say, look, I'm gonna help you learn how to live your life better. I'm gonna help you develop yeah. habits and how you move, how you eat, how you think to live your life better. That you, if you can't sell yeah. that. And at the same time, you're trying to sell weight loss or fat loss. And people think, well, I don't need a coach to do that. I don't need a trainer to do that, right? I need someone who's going to help me work hard, yell at me, keep me on track, make sure I show up, all those things. So because it's all about willpower, because it's just about cutting things out of your life, it's not about adding anything to your life at that point. That's all another, we could, we know, you know, we could get on, we could get on that one. So that, sorry, that just, that just hit me like that's part of the issue. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, I, I, a lot of people have that kind of stigma or think, you know, a personal trainer is a certain thing or whatever. And I, I'll give you a good example. Somebody hired me this summer to do some strength training with her. She's in her 20s. And we were just kind of like working out at a park close to where we both live. And I would bring equipment for her and we would just like pull on bands and do some, you know, work with whatever we had. Well, you know, here in Salt Lake City, it started to snow and get really cold. So we needed an indoor facility to work out. And um, generally speaking, the, the, the kind of gym space that we built in our basement is where my wife is. And it's not really a great place for both of us to be at the same time. And she lives in an apartment, so it wasn't really great to work out for her. So we found a facility that I can train people at that is amazing. It's I love it. It's an awesome place with the best machines. Like seriously, they've got like 40 and 50 year old Nautilus like oh, wow. pull down machines that you can't find. Some of the machines they have are like the only ones in the state. It's fantastic. But it's also where a lot of like bodybuilders go. It's very intimidating. All these machines, like I'm intimidated by a lot of them. I don't know how some of them even work. Like they're, it's a lot. And, and so we started to train there and this is like, not this person's like exact best place to be. Yeah. It's very intimidating for her, but she also works at another, she also works out at another gym with her boyfriend who likes this other gym. And to hear her a few months ago, tell me like, yeah, I'm going to this other gym and I'm way less intimidated now because I know what machines I can go to and I can go to the leg press. And I don't feel like I'm out of place. I, I know what to do. I know where the chest press is and the rows. And since we've done this program design, I know what exercises to do and how to stay balanced. And that to me made me more proud than anything else. So this person is like now not feeling intimidated. And I'll just say too, like, man, like <laughs> if, if most of my clients knew the program that we were doing, like they don't really need me anymore. I would say probably a hundred percent of my clients don't really need me to know what exercises to do. They mm -hmm. can do them on their own. They could probably be motivated enough to do them on their own and they don't need me there. But like part of the value of training people is it's within a very short amount of time. My clients are my family. They are like, my people, I know more about them than a lot of other people very close to them in their lives. We talk about things and, and workshop, not only like health and fitness and nutrition. And we, yeah, I count reps and yeah, we're pushing strength and we're doing these things to like make you strong, but also like, I'm not a therapist, but like, I'm talking to these people in a very deep way. And like, we laugh together and we cry together and like, they become family. And I, I would be willing to submit that. Yeah. Like these people know what to do. They don't need me anymore but they kind of continue doing and paying for services because we as trainers, if you're a good trainer, like you're talking to people, you're understanding people, you're workshopping things. You're it's, it's a lot of emotional support yeah. that you're helping people with. And so I think that's a huge value also that a lot of people don't understand and don't realize until they start working with a trainer is like, there's a lot of value to having somebody, you know, 
you know, be like a caddy for a golfer where we're setting up exercises for you. You don't need to think about your program. That said, you can also ask us anytime and we should be able to tell you exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it at any given time. I know you have, you and I yeah. have talked about that in the past, but it's more, it's, it, it comes to be more than that where like we create like really deep emotional bonds with people. And, and that's why I would say most people continue yeah, with absolutely, us over time. Absolutely. And that's, that's honestly to me, uh, the, why I coach seeing the success mm -hmm. of people it's completely selfish it's a completely selfish. I, I'm, if there's a series of books which if you haven't read um i don't even remember what the full title is it's like the um the it's like a their philosophical it's like the philosophical um analysis of superheroes it's like uh the phil like like uh the, oh, the philosophy of Superman, the philosophy of Batman, the philosophy of Wonder Woman. Like it takes some of these superheroes and it breaks down what's going on in the back end of the stories of these comic book heroes that you don't even consider. Right. And one of the, one of my favorite ones was Superman. It was the philosophy of Superman. And the guy breaks down. He's like, look, Superman is an alien. Superman's overriding virtue or compass the moral decisions that he makes in life have everything to do with about being accepted on earth. Everything mm -hmm. he does is about helping people so that he can, that they can feel good about him and allow him to be on this planet. Right. That's a, like, there's wow. this whole, and it, there's a whole book about just digging into the, the mindset and philosophy of Superman. And I think about that a lot as a coach, like this is complete, you know, it, and the idea of that was everything he's doing is selfish because it's all about him. He wants to be accepted. He wants this. He, it's all about how he feels about his place on this earth. And me as a coach, I'm a coach because I'm selfish. I'm a coach because I feel good about being part of someone else's success. That makes me feel good. That makes me feel like I had something to do with that. I didn't do the work. I help them figure things out for themselves. I help them, but being part of that, um, I can't. I can't tell you how much every day. Anytime I'm having a struggle, because you know how it is. Sometimes you don't feel great as a coach. Sometimes you know someone quit that you didn't want to quit, or you're having a, you're trying to figure this out for this person, or you're trying to put a program together and you just can't figure out how to make these things work the way you want to work, or just business isn't going well, or whatever it may be. Um, but you get that one note or that one text message about, "Hey, I did this," or "Hey, I did that," or and it's just, it just, you, everything, it's all sun and rainbows from there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I know how I would answer this question. And I, I expect an answer from you in this question. Magic wand, I give you a billion dollars. You don't need to work another day in your life. Is your Monday morning no. any different than it is now? No. I mean, from a practical perspective, from the coaching side, yeah, you know, no. Um, I mean, I'm still working a full-time job. So my Monday would actually change because then I'd be able to actually spend all the time doing what I want to do. Right. As yeah. from that perspective, yeah. yes. But from the perspective of what I do when I'm not on my job, no. Right. I would still be making videos. Yeah. I would still be working with my, my clients and doing programs. I would still be writing books. I mean, all that stuff, none of that changes. Yep. Yep. I, I agree a thousand percent. I, it's just, it's, it's so amazing and empowering to really feel like you are helping that person. Yes. We, we want man, do we want like the best results for our clients? And we talk about you and we worry about you and we think about All you nonstop. And like, man, if we could just like get your eating just a little better or just like, just this one step, let's just take this one step together. Like we want this so bad for you and we can't live your life. We can't run your miles. We want it for you and we're, we're there for you and we will celebrate every little victory that we can get. But like, Man, it, it, at the end of the day, yeah, it is a it is yep. a selfish thing yep. that we are doing by coaching people because, man, like if if my clients stopped paying me, I probably wouldn't care. Don't yeah. tell my clients that, but if they did, it would probably it would probably be true. It's just it's so joyous to to do what we do as as coaches and try to help people and for the people that it clicks for and the joy that we see in their life and the way it changes the loved ones around them. It's just, God, it's amazing. Yeah. I love yeah. it. I love Awesome, it. man. Well, I appreciate your time today and we'll definitely have to do this again. I think um, as I change up the format a little bit this year, like I didn't do any interviews at all last year. So we're, we're adding some things in this year. We've got the book coming out, doing a bunch of different things. Um, we'll have to get you on again sooner rather than later. Where can people find you and learn more about you, what you're doing, and listen to the podcast? 
Yeah, thanks, man. Um, yeah, I, I love chatting with you, whether we push record or not. I just love the time I get to spend with you. And uh, yeah, hope to yeah. run into you at the conference this, you this year. And you so cool to see that. Uh, <laughs> sounds so fun. <laughs> sounds great. Man, so yeah, the best place to find us is just our website, which is myboundlessbody.com. Uh, the first pe thing that people see is a book now button. So anybody can schedule a free 30 minute consultation with us just to ch chat about whatever I say this on every episode of my podcast. But even if it is just to like say hi, I don't know, just no. introduce yourselves and you know, just chat and let me get to know you. It's uh, we love connecting with people. So that's the best place to find us, which is myboundlessbody.com. And then the podcast is uh, Boundless Body Radio. You can find that on any place where you get your podcast we do releases every monday wednesday and friday and sometimes on the weekend as well um we've had amazing guests like you on the show i'd recommend definitely that the, the episodes that you've been on our, our show we've hosted you twice which has been awesome so yeah that's just my uh boundless body radio for our podcast and the website where you can find all of that stuff all our social media and the podcast as well would be myboundlessbody.com thanks man appreciate it we'll see you again next time see you next time